Hey, what's going on fam? I hope you're having a great day. I wanted to jump on real quick and bring you a fantastic surprise. Man, I got the absolute pleasure of talking with my good friend and mentor, John Brooks, who actually co-founded Momentum Realty. Uh, he is no longer uh, an active real estate agent. He's on the mortgage side, but he was. He was an active real estate agent. He co-founded the brokerage with his wife, Brittany Brooks. Uh, incredible people, incredible productivity when they were selling homes. And I mean, just continue to help service the Northeast Florida area with exceptional value, exceptional uh, client experience as well as uh, agent value. So I uh, absolutely love talking to him and I wanted to bring him on because John is infinitely smarter than me when it comes to the real estate market. I mean, he has insights that are greater than mine. Uh, even though I, I do have a finance background, I love talking economics. Uh, he He's just smarter than me. I have been flat out smarter than me. So I wanted to bring him on have him share his thoughts and what I thought was going to be like a maybe 10, 15 minute video ended up turning into like a podcast. So if those of you who stay around to the end, please let me know. Uh, as I was watching the video, I did not count, but count how many times I said, that's crazy. Uh, because it is, this market is nuts. And if I haven't been preaching that before, it matters more than it does than ever uh, right now. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Hey, how's it going guys? I uh, wanted to jump on real quick because I always get questions about where the market is at, where my market updates are at, and I thought I would bring on a guest today that is way more knowledgeable about this stuff. Uh, John, I wanna give an uh, introduction to you. So John Brooks is the co-founder of Momentum Realty. Uh, before this, John, before you were in Realty, what were you doing beforehand? Um, first, thanks for having me on the show, very cool. Uh, I was a real estate investment banker. So I was giving out loans that backed single family rental properties yeah. and working with large rental property aggregators and giving them money. Yeah. So you would say that you are very familiar with the real estate market uh, from a lot of different facets, from the real estate agent side, from also uh, the corporate side and, and kind of making uh, bonds and money and everything like that for institutional investors, correct? Yeah, I've seen the funnel all the way from the house being sold, where the money flows all the way to the end user, which is some investor internationally, generally, or some pension fund. Absolutely. And I've been studying it for over 10 years. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's crazy that um, you have a lot of market knowledge that a lot of other agents don't. I think a lot of agents aren't really familiar with the market. so. I love talking about this stuff. You know, my background in finance and economics and, and coming over to real estate, I saw a real gap in knowledge in most agents that a lot of people weren't able to talk about this stuff at a high level. And I think that's what attracted me most about wanting to come over to Momentum was that you guys were having these high level conversations and you were able to see where the market is going. Yeah, uh, we have front line visibility because we're real estate agents, we're on the day-to-day -day basis, but our job from the brokerage perspective is to give a big picture idea of what's going on as well, and then share that with our agents so they can properly set expectations with their customers. Because if you set the wrong expectations in today's market, you're setting yourself up for failure. Absolutely. And so I wanted to bring you on today because you know, a lot of people are having flashbacks, right? Of, oh my gosh, this is looking like 2007 again, yeah. where we're heading into this crazy market bubble and we're, the housing market's just gonna crash. And, you know, I, I have been preaching the opposite where uh, we can sustain this level of demand as long as these market conditions continue. Uh, and there's a lot of different factors that go into it that makes it so different than 2007, right? Where we had poor lending standards, we had, um, people taking money out of their home like it was nobody's business. We had um, just people running left and right and just really bad mortgage-backed securities brackets. I mean, there's so many different factors that came into it. And now we have a bunch of regulations that are uh, making this a completely different market. So tell me, in your eyes, how does this market differ? I mean, what's, what's the big separator? You said we're heading into a buyer recession, right? Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, a buyer recession is when buyers have to beg the sellers to sell it to them because the seller has 30 to 40 offers on the table and any one of those 40 offers can actually close the transaction. Uh, and so buy, sellers are typically leaning towards cash transactions so they can avoid the appraisal from the bank. 
And I don't blame them. So we say now like cash is the new 20% down conventional and VA and FHA loans are having an incredibly hard time getting accepted. You have to have a really strong agent that has relationships with other agents in the market to be able to get into the market. So again, interview your real estate agent, work with somebody like Bryson if you're if you want to get into this market and you are one of those type of buyers. But this situation is different than last time. Last time around, you, like you said, there's uh, loans going out for properties that are overbuilt with no demand just because of speculative reasons. Right now, it's the opposite. We are underbuilt and people are buying because of true demand, because of population influx, because uh, lack of supply of inventory, looking to hedge against inflation that everybody's expecting to come up. Um, various reasons. And then COVID, you know, people want more space at home. So people are upsizing, downsizing, life is happening. Uh, so we're in a tremendous uh, supply shortage of less than one month supply in many areas around Northeast Florida. And we expect it to continue for at least the next 24 to 36 months. It's going, I actually believe that it's going to get worse in that we're gonna see over the next three to five years, population influx from high cost, high tax states to Florida, to Texas, North Carolina. We're already seeing it happen. And I think it's just the beginning of this huge wave that's coming. Yeah, yeah, we'll dive into that a little bit more too. But I think, I, I know for sure that one of the most sought after states for uh, Florida is like the Californias. It's the New Yorks. It yep. is, um, New you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's unaffordable places. I don't know if you saw, I actually want to bring this up real quick too. I saw an article that one of my friends showed me that California is actually proposing something that they will have state run funds that will invest 45% ownership into homes so people can buy homes more affordable. It makes home more affordable. And it just blows my mind that people think this is a demand side issue. If we just keep funding demand, I'm, I'm thinking... We need to subsidize supply. If you're gonna if you're gonna have government intervention intervention at all, we need to to fund the supply side. We need to start subsidizing cost of lumber. I mean, as as we've seen, has tripled almost um, these cost of inputs in order to get these homes built, and that's what we need right now. We don't have any inventory, and like you said, homes are being underbuilt like crazy, and we have been underbuilt. So, in your opinion, do you think that 2008 and 2009 coming in? And underbuilding, does that like just change the mentality in a lot of builders that they didn't want to build as much? Or is this is that because of something else? Why why were we underbuilt? 08, 09, you know, it hit and the demand went off the table. People couldn't qualify, people were losing their jobs, right? And so we had all these institutional investors go in and gobble up these assets at 50, 40 cents on the dollar and hold them and turn them into rental properties. And a lot of them, those properties will not come back to the market. They're gonna be held in some sort of pension fund as a AAA product that's gonna just be there for the next 30, 40 years. They might sell off 1% of the portfolio to just kind of clean it up a little bit, but they bought them up in affordable price ranges. So not only did the builder stop building, the inventory that was there got bought up by investors that are now holding it for the long game and so you have this huge supply shortage in affordable price ranges and everything starts moving up. And then you have a pandemic that causes extreme demand for a specific location. Yeah, I, that's crazy. And I, I mean, what foresight by these institutional investors, because now, I mean, they have equity out the yin yang. And I think that's another reason that we are seeing such a change in market structure compared to 07 and 08 is, is the market equity. I mean, people, the homeowners now, have such more equity and, and the revolving debt on home equity loans is dramatically lower than 08 and 09. That's not even accounting for inflation too. I saw a statistic that said that there's only like 3% of homeowners who are still underwater. That's crazy. Because the equity gains are there. Now, if you think about it from an investor perspective, uh, they're playing the long game. Most people don't. Most people play the short game. They're looking to speculate. These guys are looking at population trends, right? right. Like when are the millennials going to come and buy? Where are the areas that people are relocating to? They're really strategic in their investments. So yeah, like they did have the foresight that this is going to happen. Um, the pandemic just sped everything up. Yeah, absolutely. I think home has never been more important than it is now. And, and COVID definitely like accelerated that like crazy. And now, so here's the thing. 
the people who are relocating here have already accumulated their wealth and they're gonna stay in that property that they're buying probably until they pass away and somebody inherits it. So the turnover is not gonna be as high. So yeah, we have the labor shortage, we have the lumber shortage, we have a land shortage. And those are the three L's for you listening, you know, that's the problem. And so the supply is gonna get worse, the demand is gonna get heavier, and there's not gonna be, the only thing that could save us is more supply and it's just not there. So it's gonna to continue to be an extraordinarily aggressive market. The only wild card that I see that could possibly blow this up is interest rates spiking, but the Fed is coming in and just throwing money at this. And in fact, they might be throwing more at it through like first time home buyer programs and things like that, which is just gonna amplify the issue. Yeah, and, and that's another, getting back to that point of, I, I just can't believe the government doesn't see that this is not a demand. We don't need to make things more affordable on the demand side. We need to make it more affordable on the supplies. You need to subsidize builders and, and encourage like prefab people. homes yeah. or some other solution. I mean, that's yeah. and that's I think we're going to need some sort of innovation of some sort where we're going to need to find an alternative to our traditionally built homes. We haven't had innovation here in, the, in construction in I want to say like 70 years. I saw something like that. I mean, we've been building homes like this. Well, yeah, sure. We have some technology that comes in and makes a little, life a little bit easier, but nothing revolutionary in home building. It, we need it. Uh, we needed it yesterday. We definitely need it today. And I don't think it's going to come for quite some time. I mean, there's so many supply chain issues in every industry right now. Like there's new construction homes that don't have windows and they're sitting, you know, vacant and they don't have the windows. They can't get the windows to finish the product. They're going to need that for prefab homes too, right? So like the supply chain, even if they figure out how do I build this product in this location, ship it here, plop it down on this, they have to develop the land. It's more complicated than it might seem and it takes more time and logistics to be able to make it happen. And I just don't see it happening fast enough. No, I, I mean, what there's nothing that can be done in the short term to, and that's why you're saying it's going to be 24 to 36 months till we see some sort of market response. Maybe. To the supply side. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I mean, who it knows? Get, I think I, my personal opinion is it's going to become an even harder market to operate in as a real estate agent or a buyer. Um, and you're really good. If you're a real estate agent, you want to work with sellers. If you're a buyer, you're, you need to interview the best agents with the best relationships possible who are specialists in specific neighborhoods who know inventory before it comes to the market. Otherwise, your odds are against you heavily. And so my encouragement, again, I don't know why consumers don't put in the extra effort to work with somebody who knows what they're doing. But if you listen to this, uh, get with Bryson and he will be able to connect you with off-market properties. Right. Yeah, we have our coming soon listings and, and momentum where we kind of at least alert people of like, hey, this is what we're working on right yes. now. And here's what's coming up. I mean, you need that right now. You need to have uh, work with a brokerage that is going that communicates with each other. I see so many yeah. brokerages that just don't work with each other. And you, teamwork yeah. makes the dream work. And I know it's, we're individual business owners and a brokerage, but man, we help our, each it's other's a business grow. Game. Yeah. Just as much as it is with the customers, it is with the agents. A good agent wants to work with other good agents. Absolutely. And 70% of agents do less than four transactions per year. So 70% of the time you're getting stuck, you know, with that, <laughs> uh, you know, on the other side of it. So your, your goal is just find that great agent, have, see if they, they have off market opportunities or they can find a way to get you into the market. So you're not competing against the other 40 offers. Absolutely. I, and I, I, it's just crazy how, how offers, everybody thinks you just have to throw money at the solution and, and agents think that they're just like, money just doesn't get the offer accepted I know because we see offers that 30, 40, 50,000 over and they get rejected. Yeah. But so it comes down to terms. It comes down to terms. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. So we're going to get into some market stats real quick, okay. um, just to kind of go over just a brief overview, because I, you know, I think having these conversations is more beneficial to a lot of people than just going over simple stats. Sure. But these help us guide our conversation a little more. So we have record low active listings, right? At 3,991. And this is as of uh, the end of May, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, that's crazy low. And we'll have all of these slides up for you guys as well. Fastest sales ever at 48 days average. And that doesn't even take into account the quality of home, right? A right. good quality home, I can tell you right now, 
you know, I, I put my listings up on Thursday and they last the weekend. You know, that's uh, any good home uh, lasts maybe 24 to 72 hours. And the only reason it lasts longer than 24 hours is because we're trying to get as many offers as possible, right? Yeah, I'm actually surprised it's 48. Uh, yeah. It's partly because it's an average, right? So it's right. using the luxury and it's using some properties that are in terrible condition. Yeah. That nobody can, you know, whatever. So absolutely. When you bracket it down, it definitely is that. I mean, that sub 300 range is oh, uh, brutal. It's so brutal. I have seen some awful properties go for way more than, than you would expect. And that's just the new market paradigm. And it's so hard educating people. Um, to think like that too, you know, you're stuck in the past. It, it, it's well, it's hard. It's hard, and you don't realize it until you've been in the market and you've you've thrown ten offers, and your your agent's like, okay, rejected, let's rejected. try this again, and you're like, okay, finally, I I understand. I have to do this, this, and this in order to get my offer accepted, right? And it's not even just that. I'm I'm doing everything I can to make my terms as uh, impressive as possible. Yeah. So like, you know, the typical agent, like, let's go find the perfect home for you. It's like not even finding it. Like if you find it, it's like getting it under contract yeah. and that comes down to the terms. Um, the homes are selling faster than ever. For yeah. sure. It's, it is wild out there. So, um, we have our highest sales price ever. I, this graph blew my mind when we presented yeah. it at our, our in-person meeting. Um, you know, I knew, <laughs> obviously everybody's average sales price has gone up solely because the market has as well. I yeah. mean, mine's jumped tremendously but when i saw this i mean <laughs> just last year i want to say we were at like 260 was our average sales price to yep. go up 73 77 thousand dollars on average sales price in a year is ridiculous and i think it's a lot of people that look at that number and they're like this can't be sustainable well if the current market conditions continue to exist then <laughs> it's going to keep doing this right it will it's a supply and demand game so it's not even sustainable it's like what option do i have yeah. renting and like we just met somebody the other day that's like my rent went up 400 dollars, and now i can't even save for a down payment so that to continue renting maybe for the rest of the time that they stay in jacksonville or they have to move to an outskirt of jacksonville to have it be cheaper so uh, I see prices continuing to move up. Uh, yeah. People who bought five, six years ago look like geniuses right now. I mean, even last year, they mm -hmm. look like geniuses. I, yeah. I, I know <laughs> some of my clients are jumping for joy when I, I reach out to them. I'm like, hey, did you know your property value? I can probably sell it for about 30000 plus more than what we bought it for just last year. They're like, really? I just got done with one of my sales that they bought last year, new construction, two hundred ninety k. Uh, we ended up selling it for 365 cash yep. in a year. I mean, that is a ridiculous amount. And I mean, it looks poised to appreciate at a similar rate. And I think a lot of people don't realize that if we see any sort of supply start to come back on the market or anything, it's not going to be like a crash. We're not going to see a crash like 07, 08. It's just going to be a slower rate. The supply is not there to make it crash. Exactly. It's, exactly. They can't keep up. Like it, it would slowly move down. Like usually you see the pendulum swing from buyer's market to seller's market or seller's market to buyer's market very quickly. We're not going to have that happen because there's not just going to be a glut of supply. And a lot of people are talking about, oh, you know, the yeah, foreclosure. Yeah, just we'll get into that. that. Okay, yeah, cool. No, I'm, so let's let's get into that conversation now because you know, I, high profile people are saying stuff like this. I have one person that sticks out is like Ken McElroy, which is uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's real estate advisor, sure. and, and did that. And I watched some of his videos, and I I understand like what the numbers might suggest, but it doesn't make any sense. Like they're talking about, oh yeah, once the rent moratoriums end, once uh, people have to pay back those balloon payments and stuff, they're gonna get slammed. Uh, market supplies gonna come back. We're seeing a market crash. And I'm sitting here like market equity or home equity is still a thing. Like all they have to do is if they can't afford a, a loan uh, modification or anything like that, if they can't refinance or come to better structures or afford the balloon payment, you sell and you're still making so much money so much money so uh you are a little more uh informed in the mortgage industry so uh, tell people why they like what these forbearance numbers and stuff like that are they dwindling do you see that happening so it looks scary but like we're short two million homes yeah right now yep uh and the maximum number of properties that probably could come that we could see come to the market starting September and onward is 600,000. That's not gonna <laughs> wipe out the demand, the overwhelming demand. Also, it's in specific areas, right? So yeah. real estate's hyper-localized. 
Jacksonville, for one, uh, the equity has come up so much that, again, most people are not underwater anymore. And the equity is rising faster than the interest and fees accumulated from the non-payment. So they can do loan modification. Secondly, if there's this giant wave of foreclosures that are coming in, there's an institutional investor backdrop now that will buy them at a certain rate of return. So I just don't see that kind of wave changing this market because it's just not enough supply, even all that coming to market. And Florida is a judicial state. And that means that all the foreclosures have to go through the court systems. And that can take two to three years. Yeah. And it's all been put off by COVID. So even if that started happening, we have two to three years more, prices continue to move up. There's This isn't something that's going to happen. I just don't see it in our local market. And keep in mind, Jacksonville is still hundred to $200,000 less than other major cities like Tampa and Orlando, even after this 70 to $80,000 increase in one year. Yeah. And that's just in the Southeast. I mean, like you yeah. said, we're, we're talking about places that are trying to avoid the high cost, high tax areas. It's about uh, opportunity cost in a big, in a big play. And what is it going to cost me to rent versus buy? What are the other cities that I can relocate to that have the similar opportunities? And that's really important to consider. And Jacksonville is still extremely attractive. We also have insulators in Jacksonville. What I mean by that is we have the Mayo Clinic, we have Navy bases. So even if there was some sort of recession, these people aren't going to lose their jobs. These are people who are going to be permanently employed, paid through by the government and pay their mortgages. So the supply is not going to come. Yeah, I, I talk about this all the time in my market updates that we have such an insulated economy here, right? And Healthcare. Sharing. Yeah, well, that's what I was just about yeah. to say is shipping and logistics. I mean, yep. in general, we've seen such a boom in that we yeah. can't keep up with CSX, that. That's another demand. Transportation, right? Like we have, and we have a headquarters, somebody's relocating. There's so much money pouring in here. It's absurd. Yeah. And if you were here five years ago and you're here today, it would be unrecognizable of the growth. And we think it's really just going to continue to speed up even faster than it is now. Yeah, there's tax benefits for companies moving here. And even another big thing that I've seen too, and I saw a study on it, but it's the remote workers. A lot of people are yes. staying remote with COVID. And everybody's seeing that, hey, people are happier. They're working better sometimes. Not all the time. Some people get distracted. But um so why would i keep this worker here employed here when i could just move him down to florida right. say we'll pay your moving benefits we have tax benefits by doing so and you have a better cost of living yeah now, who knows at this rate it might not last much longer <laughs> but hey but it's all relative because yeah. it's increasing everywhere else then this is still behind the curve and so i still think there's there's room for this market to really go and come up another hundred, two hundred thousand dollars for the same exact product that's out there today. Yeah. And so, and it's hard explaining to people that you know it's either buy now or regret later. I mean, and it is one of those things. Another thing I want to talk about too is uh, let's talk about the catch twenty two for sellers because okay. I I think that a lot of sellers are having a, a hard time justifying selling their home. Okay. Um, we're seeing these interest rates that are kept artificially low because of the government throwing money at the mortgage-backed securities market. And they're saying, well, we can't buy anything if we sell. We're going to end up refinancing. And that's just cannibalizing the, the supply even further. What do we do about that? I mean, how, how does that resolve itself? Because why, why would people sell if they could just refi? They have to be truly motivated either by like moving for job relocation, death in the family, something happening. But if they're looking to upsize or downsize, there really needs to be a true motivation and a deadline for that move to occur. Otherwise, they're really just testing the market to see what they can get. And if they don't have a great agent who can navigate that transition for them with specific terms like rent, rent lease backs for, you know, two months or an extension of the closing date, really creative terms and written correctly, then they could get stuck having to rent somewhere and then having the same problem that every other buyer has. Thankfully, you have your off market list and you have creative terms. But, you know, again, you have to have those to be able to navigate this market. 100%. Yeah. I think a lot of people too that I, you know, I talked to some of my sellers as well and they're like, you know, honestly, Bryson, we're just going to rent until we have inventory. And it's like, it's one of those things where I'm like, man, I, you know, I think I, sure. If you want to rent until we find something that's appealing to you, like you have time, but I don't think it's going to get any better than it is well, right now. So let's say that prices start cooling off. They're not going to go down. I really don't yeah. see that scenario. 
city stop cooling off and stop going up 10%, you know, whatever. If the Fed stops buying mortgage-backed securities and interest rates move up, 1% increase in interest rate increase, it decreases your purchasing power by 10%. Yeah, that's crazy. So you're screwed yeah. if you wait one way or another. And the, probably what will happen is prices will go up and interest rates will go up yeah. at the same time. And that's going to be a double impact to these buyers who are relocating here. Absolutely. And I'm going to go ahead and plug my video too. If you haven't checked out the importance of interest rates or uh, amortization in general, please go check out those videos. Those are Wealth Wednesdays, episodes three and four. I'll go ahead and link those above. But yeah, interest rates are so vitally important. I think if we do, now let's talk about too, I, there's a slide on here. Well, we'll talk about this one because okay. I think this is astounding too. I also saw this one and this was another one that made my jaw drop. Yeah. We're seeing 36.9% of properties selling above list price. And that's, um, you know, I try to tell all my sellers like, let's price competitively because people who have been in the market who are serious about making the move are going to look at that list they price know. and say, we're going up from there. Yep. Um, and that's what happens. And I, yep. I it, it is always a struggle trying to tell their teach sellers that kind of mindset because they're, you know, yeah. the past. it's an auction. Yeah. But you it, want I'm, all the bidders at the table. Your, your yep. goal is to solely drive as much traffic as possible incite the fact that you want as many offers as possible, but it's also teaching buyers. And I, I can't show them how I can't tell you how many times I've shown them a graph like this and said, and they don't get so, it until yeah, they lose five times. They, or, they yeah. think they're going to still find a deal in this market, or a deal. And Where? I, I say it is a deal. Even if you go, 30k above list price. I mean, if we continue at the same pace, you're going to look like a genius, you know, when we end up going 100k over list price. And, uh, you know, I, I just have a hard time shoving this information into people's heads because the real estate market has changed so much just in the past few years. Um, so I, again, just want to touch up on this. I, I mean, tell you, you know, we're, we work with a lot of investors and they're just happy to buy it at whatever the comps were in the yeah. last six months. Uh huh. And then it's pure speculation that it's going to continue going up, but they've had a great time doing that. So, and they're finding stuff off market. If mm -hmm. it's on market, it's available to everybody. It's going to be the biggest auction in town. If it's off market, you might be able to be the one buyer for that. Just accept the offer. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. So, uh, that's the number one thing you can do. There's not even deals off market. People are really aware that this is a hot market. Uh, yeah. You can buy them, but it's an extraordinary amount of work and it still probably isn't going to be a deal in the typical sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, it is just mindset change in this market. So this is the slide I wanted to get to the housing affordable okay. affordability issue, because I think it ties into interest rates. When you spoke about that 1% increase in interest rates, cutting down your purchasing power by 10%, I think a lot of people have a, a hard time grasping that, hey, interest rates are looking, unless the, the government keeps spending like it is and kicking the can down the road, um, you know, we're inevitably going, this is as low as interest rates get. You know, I don't, it, it can't get any lower. I don't, there's no benefit if it goes any lower, right? So um, talk, talk to a, them a little bit about what the housing affordability issue is. Yeah, so the housing affordability index basically tracks how much the median household income is against the cost of affordability for uh, a property, for an average property in a specific location. So affordability has been going down. So if this, if you're looking at this chart and it shows like 125, that basically means that they have 25% more income than it would to be required to purchase that home. Right. So it used to be, you know, just a few years ago, over 200%. And now it's at like 125. So if it crosses the line at the 100, that starts to be an area where you need to be like, okay, is the market overheated? Is it over, you know, over purchased? All that kind of stuff. Here's the interesting thing with the labor supply issue, wages could go up. So household income could go up and this could kind of bottom off here. Right. And it, it might not be as big of an issue as you think. And so the demand could still be there. Right. And then again, it all comes down to opportunity costs. What, where's rent's going to be? Yeah. Is it still three to $400 cheaper for me to buy and use my house as a savings account than it is to just throw my money away to rent and get no tax benefits? Yeah. The answer I, is always buy. Absolutely. absolutely. The yeah. best time to buy always is right now. And it's time in the market versus time in the market when it comes to the housing market, for sure. I well, mean, let's say you buy an 07. Yeah. 
your your house is half paid off and it's above where it was before and inflation wiped out a lot of your debt. Yeah. So even if you get the timing wrong and you think long term like the investors do, who cares? It's about cash flow. It's not just about appreciation. Absolutely. And I, I that leads into another great topic. I, I, I tried to explain to people what uh, inflation induced debt destruction is. Okay. And you are the only person that I've talked to that really grasped the concept, even I mean way better than I do. So can you break it down simply? What is inflation induced debt destruction? Okay, so when you get a mortgage, your loan balance goes down every single month with each payment. Um, and if the value of a dollar increases, uh, sorry, if things become more expensive, like your house, your house price goes up, but the value of your debt stays the same. So your it basically inflates away your debt while your ass while your house it basically increases with the uh, inflation. Right. Absolutely. There's a video that can explain this way better <laughs> than I can, um, but I understand how it works. And this is the number one thing that people don't talk about is how inflation can absolutely wipe away the value of that debt over a specific period of time. Because again, your debt is fixed other than the pay down. Absolutely. Yeah, no. So basically what John's saying is value goes up with inflation as well as other factors, but inflation is one of the factors for that leads to increasing home prices. And as that happens, what remains the same is your monthly payment. You are locked into your monthly payment, right? Maybe I'll give it an example another way that will resonate. Um, if you have an interest rate of 3% and inflation is 5%, in real terms, you made 2% yeah. on that borrowing because the debt stays the same while your asset actually went up to 5%. That is a beautiful example. Yeah, no, so that you're making 2% and that's not even accounting for an increase in home equity as the value goes up. I, and if you think about it from an investor, that also their cash flow marks to market with the, res, with the lease renewals. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a great asset. So as rent goes up too, they're making more money as well. So it, it just makes sense. You want it's to buy the best risk. inflation hedge. I mean, you could buy stocks with consumer products that have a lot of debt too, that use that same philosophy. Um, but a house can be highly leveraged. You can put three, five percent down and get into that inflation hedge like that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that is, and it's a real asset. Why wouldn't you? It's a real asset. You know, it's something that's tangible. You can't. It's it is the best asset to hedge yourself against. And inflation. that's why they say ninety percent of millionaires did so through real estate. Yeah, uh, because you just buy it, you hold it, and over a period of time, it pays itself off. I, it blows my mind, but you know, it's, it's hard to instruct people, um, that that's what makes millionaires. Like 90% of other people are doing it. Don't try to break the cycle. Just join them, mimic yeah. them. And people who are concerned about timing of the market, just know that the institutional investors are still buying. Right. Absolutely. So if they're still buying, you follow the, you follow the money, right? So and money's we, flowing in from actual retail money's flowing in from investors. Right. So it makes sense. Um, we're going to go over the, the market. I'll go ahead and, and throw up some of the numbers there for you. But um, this is just to show you how crazy the market is. A lot of the numbers are skewed, though, uh, when you're looking at historical terms, because we did have the we, yeah. we had the shutdown in March 2020. Our shutdown didn't last long here in Florida, no. right? It was about two months. And then we were like, OK, back to business. Yep. Um, you know, and I'm thankful that we had economic continuation. But um, yeah, so we did have a blip in numbers. So if you see For a little two bit, months, yeah, yeah. like a slowdown of 20 to 30 percent, and then it popped right back right. up. Oh, it exploded. I've never seen a people had their biggest back. year ever. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was it was wild. It was wild. So, um, this is we're gonna go into that, uh, and we've kind of already covered our buyer recession right there, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and flash this slide for you right here as well. But no housing crisis is coming. I think that's the bottom line that we need to, uh, we're just trying to highlight here is that it, if you ever had a question about buying a home, now's the time to do so because there's no housing lock crisis. Lock in the coming. interest rate. Because I mean, if you could lock again, like we said, we lock interest rate at three. We just, the inflation numbers came out at 4.2. So you're locking in a 1.2% gain on that debt on, in terms of real dollar terms mm -hmm. every single year that you have that mortgage. You're leaving money on the table by not buying. And that's what the institutional investors know. And there's no way that in the next five to seven years, in my mind, unless there's massive technology increases in every single asset class, that we don't have a high period of inflation 
um, in the market, or the government will step in and pop the bubble and you know jack up interest rates to slow down inflation. Yeah. So it's going to be one or the other, but either way, you want to be in long term debt. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so let's let's reiterate that too. You want to be in long term debt. I think there has never cost. There has never been a better time to be leveraged in this market. Which no. I don't like you. You want to leverage the fact that you can get debt. In order to find other cash Good building, debt. yeah, right. We're not going debt. out and buying an no. asset that depreciates. No We're credit card that debt, too. cash flow that will appreciate with inflation. You know that yeah. kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, you're gonna find a return on um, and at the immediate return. Yeah, immediate return. So, um, yeah, I think we we talked about institutional rental portfolios and that they've just gone up and. Man, they really capitalized in 2012 and they just kind of went yeah. off from there. 2012 I mean, to 2014, they were gobbling up homes that were 2,000 square feet for 174,000 and were killing it and then renting them out. And they've just been trading the portfolios up to different asset managers and they're doing fantastically well. They're not doing as well as you would think in terms of the rent because they have a lot of repairs, right? Like, this is a physical asset. Like, if you think that, you have to have irrigation systems. Like what if the grass goes bad and they get a letter from the HOA and there's stuff that breaks. So it's very expensive to run these things. But again, they have other people paying down this asset for them and there's hyper appreciation that's occurring right now and inflation's coming in and wiping away the debt. So yeah. they are sitting really well, but you would you would be surprised if you look at their income statements. Yeah, that probably like from a cash much, flow perspective. From a cash flow perspective, it doesn't look beautiful, but you don't want it to look beautiful because you want to pay tax. Right, So Absolutely. this is actually, uh, you know, the single family rentals, are, they're still buying them. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were buying like 40 to 50 a month, each, each one of the different um, institutional investors. Yeah. It's, that's wild. Um, it's, so you wonder why you can't get in to the yeah, market? Part of that is Wall Street. And it's it's inventory we won't ever see again, right? I mean, they're just trading amongst themselves. They right? do dispositions on about 1% of their portfolio, but it's not statistically significant. Yeah. Yeah. I so, mean, yes. We're they're keeping 90% of their, 99% of their portfolio still. And you're releasing 1% back into the wild. So, yeah. American <laughs> Homes for Rent, Progress Homes, Invitation Homes, First Key. These are operators that work in our local market. That 1%. What do you know if there's any criteria for them to release that one percent, or is it's that just like dilapidated estates that are like, ah, it's it, it's just not useful anymore. It's, it's just like they asset. trim up the portfolio. Like this right. one's not operating well. There's an apartment building behind it. It's not appreciating well. You know, they learn. They yeah. they learned along the way. This was not an asset class ever before this. Right. You know, the, the last great recession occurred, and now it's an asset class, and they learned okay what works well and what doesn't, and they have very specific criteria that they go to. Like for example, they're buying houses that were built in the last twenty years only. They're buying it seventeen hundred square feet and larger, right? Yeah. Because people they know people want three bedrooms, two baths versus a two two or one two. They're not buying condos. They're not buying townhomes. Those usually don't appreciate as well. They don't cash flow as well. So they're doing it in a way that's very strategic. But they're also learning along the way what is the easiest type of property to maintain. Right. Wow. So many good nuggets in there, guys. <laughs> uh, like just hear that out. So I, I mean, like you know, when I tell people to look into the future. I always tell people to think in terms of what the the population wants, right? So like the three twos, you know, when you look at one, two or two, two, yeah, sure. You probably get a return on it. But when you look at the opportunity cost, uh, you could have got a three, two, if you had just gone up a little bit, man, you could have had a return on that. So well, what's interesting is pre-COVID, a lot of people thought that everyone was going to be downsizing into smaller units. Um, in like in, wanted to be in the middle of the city. And then when COVID hit and everybody had to go to remote work, everyone's like, I don't have enough room. Right. So they wanted four bedrooms and two baths at least, or you know, the homes that were 3,000 square feet and weren't selling now become the most attractive thing on the market because they need that home office. Yeah. That's good stuff. <laughs> it's super valuable information. Yeah. If you're looking to buy, I would go for a four two. I think four twos are more valuable yeah. with an office. For even. sure. I would mm -hmm. not say adding in that yeah. flex space has never been more important. I don't think that's going to change because no. like you said, people are relocating here and doing remote work here. Yeah. So uh, keeping up to date with housing trends is so important for setting yourself up for success in the future. And single family rentals are great because a lot of millennials who are the buyers right now with the with the wave that's coming, they have pets. Yeah. They want to have the dog. They want to have the cat. They want to have the backyard with the good view. 
So if you think about it, you know, you might as well go for, sing- I would definitely go for single family rental or a single family home over a condo or townhome, unless you really don't need that. Right, right. Um, cool. So like you said, this is this wasn't an asset class till like 2012 came around. and then From was, an institutional yeah, perspective. Exactly, yes, exactly. Uh-huh. Um, okay, cool. We're talking about homeowner equity. We've talked about that in great detail, how, how much it's increased. But I think this slide right here will show you just how much it's increased, 16.2% just in a year. In a year over year, year change is 16.2%. Um, so do you see that slowing down at all? I mean, we talked locally. about it, right? I mean, Not locally. I mean, like there's going to be some pockets in the Northeast or out West that are really expensive that people are going out of. But when, you know, when you talk to the people there, they're like, things are still selling there too, because again, the inflation issue. So like, yeah, we have the taxes, we have this, we have that, but people want to load up with good debt. Yeah. And those areas are still going to remain attractive from a job perspective because real estate is usually built all around jobs and schools. So if it's still an attractive area from that perspective, people will still want to live there um, in those innovative hubs. But yeah, homeowner equity has skyrocketed and you can't have a housing crash if there's equity. If there's equity <laughs> right. That's backed by real demand, not speculation. And again, like there's a lot of people out there who are not speculating. They're buying because they legitimately need a place to live. Right. And, you know, I, and that is... Again, a huge factor of why this is different because the demand of last recession was artificial. It right? was like some waitress buying five properties and didn't have to show income and speculate, hoping it would go up a million dollars and then sell them and retire and have no renter plan. Right. That's exactly. not what's happening. It's the opposite. It's yeah. like, you know, they're all trying to buy just a place to live so they don't have to rent. Yeah, homes were viewed as like speculation. They were uh, they were cash it's like AMC or account. GameStop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Bitcoin. Or no. Oh, let's not go there. I know. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to. Well, like, we can talk about that another time. Are, yes, sir. <laughs> um, this is a good place. Like I said, I I have a good idea because everybody talks to me about wanting to move to Florida, and I yeah. I hear about the states of of high uh, emigration versus immigration. So. Um, yeah, again, we'll flash this right here, but the high cost, uh, high tax states like California, um, uh, Michigan, uh, Michigan kind of surprised me because I, I do have a few people looking for Michigan and that, I, uh, I didn't think Michigan was that expensive or a high cost place. Do, do you have any idea? When they had the shutdowns, it was very intense. Like okay. it was one of the most intense cities politically. I don't know if that has to do with it at all. I don't have any political preference. Right. Um, I just know that. There's people moving from there to Florida. Absolutely. It could Maybe be the weather. Yeah, I was going to say, like, that's why I moved to Florida. You know, yeah, Florida. and then we have the Northeast as well, right? So New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, New York. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, you have, you have Baltimore, all the all the good stuff over there. So, um, And then they're coming down to the Southeast. They're there's, going to Texas. They're going to... They're uh, selling their million-dollar house and then coming here and saying, I can get a $500,000 house that's twice the space with a beautiful view with no state income tax. Why, with a mild climate that's close to the beach, why would I not do that yeah. and then relocate my whole family here too? You know what I mean? And Absolutely. I can work remotely, so who cares? Yep. And, and I mean, that's just... what. I don't see that changing anytime soon, especially with this new world order where we do have remote work and um, businesses are trying to find a way to cut expenses, right? And one of the biggest expenses, tax, taxes. So yeah, they're going to start migrating to Tennessee is another big state. I know Nashville has yep. completely blown up um, because they have favorable tax climate. It's secondary market. Texas. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's, it's everywhere that has a favorable tax market or um, just really appealing to consumers. Raleigh, North Carolina. Like, you know, mm-hmm. Apple's putting a campus there. Yeah, it's Amazon. becoming a huge it's tech, tech hub. hub. Yeah, yeah. it's at Austin tech hub. Right? Well, Boise, Boise's getting a lot of people too. I saw something crazy about like 120 people showed up for an open house in Boise and yeah. it was like a rundown, like two, two. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy how this market is. And, and there's, there's an investor I talked to. He put a house on the market and it didn't even have a picture of the house and he got like 20 offers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just like, had the address and the price. And people so were like, crazy. I don't care what it is. Is, here's cash. Yeah, I mean, I have a listing right now that they're like, we've been trying to buy in this neighborhood forever. forever. Yes. What do you want? <laughs> I tried buying for myself with my wife even pre-pandemic, and it was it took us six months to buy, and we're some of the top agents locally. So right, I mean, we, we know people, and we've been asking around, and it still took us that long. Yeah, that is that's wild. So find somebody who knows your neighborhood, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that helps out a ton, and. 
And like John said, he even knew the neighborhood. It took him six knew months. Knew neighborhood, so. sell hundreds of homes per year, still can't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Myself. It's, yeah, so. so we are feeling your pain we, as well. We relate to you. Yes. yes. We understand what you go through, which is actually really important from an agent perspective because yeah. there's a lot of emotions that go through this process. Yeah. A lot of my viewers know that I just bought a house as well and I was in the same boat. I was losing out, waiving commission. I, I'd say, you know. I don't need any closing costs. Staying Staying up at night worried about the appraisal. When is it going to happen? And I, the only way I survived is I found a private deal. I found a private transaction where they were thinking about listing the next month. And I said, whoa, 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 name your close date. I will waive commission. I'll represent both sides. I will make this as smooth as possible. And I, we ended up miraculously getting it. So believe me, we, we do feel your pain. I promise. We do. Um, So uh, another big reason that we have such a high demand this this is the biggest population that's come on to the market since baby boomers right yeah millennials i mean millennials are coming on and they're forming families and households that is just driving this even further um it and they have good jobs yeah they do have good jobs. i mean we're, we're one of the highest educated uh populations that has ever lived i mean um and <laughs> that age-old adage where a degree got you a good paying job isn't even a, a thing anymore. You know, people, I, I don't know. It's it's crazy to see how millennials are performing in this market. And I, I feel bad for them because it, uh, it's, housing has never been so inaffordable that it is right now. And these millennials just want to buy homes in droves and they can't. Yeah, they don't want to rent. They're savvy. They don't want to rent. They don't want to, you know, they want to build, they want that forced savings account every single time they pay that monthly payment. Absolutely. And they get it. They like get the game. Like you don't even have to explain it to most of the ones that we sit down with. It's just a matter of, can they get in? Yeah. Good. And that's the case for most market populations. So it's not just millennials finding that right now. Um, we talked about the three L's, the lack of land, lack of uh, lumber, lack of labor, yeah. too, and, and just the whole labor supply. Um, and they're not going to save us. No, it's not. I mean, I, I, I don't see anything coming that's going to change the market drastically that's going to change it like that. Right now, it took about 12 months for us to see the effects of COVID hit, right? I mean, this is what's happening. That's the reason we're seeing this spike in lumber, spike in labor prices, spike in land prices is... It's COVID, right? It took 12 months for the market to respond. So like the the builders right now, when they're building communities, they're auctioning off lots. That's just land that's not even developed sometimes. And then they're giving contracts out with a floating price based on where lumber will come in at. So the buyers, like even when they're trying to build something, they don't even know what they're going to get. It's crazy. And so we've had bidding up. I mean, I've seen it with my wife where there's like 70 people who want to make an offer. And again, it comes down to getting a really experienced agent that has a relationship with site agents in the community that's going to be able to be your first call if something falls through or if there's an opportunity to get a lot under contract. Yeah. Relationships matter. It's all, everything's about relationships anyway. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, I think we covered about everything, man. This was we sick. talked about a lot. So. Yeah, we talked yeah. about a lot of stuff. Yeah. This was an extensive talk, and I, the whole reason I, I decided I was like, John, let's get you off <laughs> our market update because I think we can have these high level conversations that are really going to inform the the savvy consumer who wants to know more about what's happening in the market and has the ability to shift their mindset of, I mean, even three years ago, what the market looked like then versus now. I mean, you have to adapt in this market. Uh, to survive in order to get the home and realize that whatever price you get it at, it's worth it. Yeah. And just a hedge here, uh, this is not investment advice. Yeah, that is and, a great point. Uh, you know, you make the decisions at your own risk. And I can tell you, my money's in the game. And yeah. I believe in this market. I live here. Our group, you sell many homes. We're all have an interest in this market continuing moving forward and there's nothing we can see on the horizon that's going to stop this growth yeah absolutely i couldn't have said it better myself okay. yes <laughs> this is not investment advice believe me we we don't have license do you have licensed advisors for real estate like financial or financial advice there's tons of designations out there and they're all made up yeah. i can tell you this the ones that even have the designations they don't know because again they don't know what you and i know which is we're out there every single day working with the hundreds of buyers who are relocating here, understanding their mentality, understanding how they think. And we will be able to see it way further than somebody who's sitting in an ivory tower in Wall Street and just looking at data that lags the market. They're looking at what happened the last three months. We're looking at what's happening right 
now. Right. And there's a huge advantage to that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's You'll be able to tell your audience way ahead of anybody else if something starts to change and why that change is occurring. Absolutely. You know, and I think that's another reason that a lot of these gurus are wrong. A lot of They're people, not gurus. Yeah, gurus. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I see, put air quotes around that yeah, because... Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of them don't have skin in the game or they're not out in the trenches right Or they now. talk generally. We're talking about Northeast Florida. Yeah. And so you can't make a general statement that applies to the entire United right. States. Generally, it, it just doesn't work. It's hyper-local. Hyper-local. I mean, there's specific neighborhoods that are outpacing other neighborhoods for very specific reasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the zip code change between zip code yep. change and then you're talking about neighborhood between neighborhood. Crime, schools, yeah. jobs, I mean, everything. It all makes a huge difference. Difference. Yeah, it's funny. I always tell people I cannot, you know, there's there's realtor guidelines along the lines of I can't tell you if it's a safe or unsafe neighborhood, but what I can direct you to is a crime map and you make an informed decision on your own. Like, but it does yeah. matter. I mean, those statistics matter and some people um, get the fact that you might get less of a home, but look, that's going to appreciate quicker than other areas right now. And, you know, I talked to, I have a few buyers right now where I made the argument that like, that's a great point, Bryce. And I'm like, yeah, if you even look at a three to five year time horizon, well, it's always going to be in demand because the, the the wages that support that price range are probably always going to be there. Yeah. Even if we hit a massive recession, they're still going to qualify for that type of home. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the odds of it going down, like their only risk if something hits the fan is, is luxury. Like yeah. really expensive. That's the first thing you start to see is a dip in luxury and a dip in people buying new homes. Yeah. We're not seeing either of those. We're seeing the opposite. Yeah, we are. I'm, it's never been a better time to be in the luxury, luxury market yeah. right now. Selling like hotcakes. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's wild. I'm, I haven't seen, you know, luxury usually sits on there for about a year, right? I mean, like it's it sits on there for a while and things are lasting, you know, just as long as cash. Yeah. Too. It's again, the people from the Northeast, they're like, I'm going to sell my $10 million condo and move to Florida and buy $3 million properties for my family. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. I, it is, it's wild time. So, um, I think that about does it for us. Yes. John, do you have any closing remarks or anything you want to tell people as kind of a summary statement or anything like that? Uh, so we're with Momentum Realty. Check us out. Um, continue to follow Bryson. Bryson is one of those rare agents that genuinely and authentically care about your success and is willing to talk you through getting from wherever you are today to wherever you want to be and give it to you straight and not just try to sell you a home, but get a relationship with you for a lifetime. And I can tell you on like less than these fingers here, that's how many agents are in this local market out of 10,000 that think and operate that way. Like he doesn't have to do these YouTube videos. He does them because he genuinely authentically wants to help a customer base that believes in a specific philosophy and you wouldn't put the effort and energy in to do it. So props to you, man, on sure. making this happen. And I wish you your continued success because you have gone like this with your business and you're helping a ton of buyers and sellers. I, I think there's never been a better time to try to be the advisor rather than the salesperson, right? It's, it's never not, been a good time to be a salesperson. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But it, especially in this market, my job is not to um, lead you astray. It is to just provide value. And just like Momentum has done for me and continues to do for the rest of Northeast Florida, I mean, the agents we have are incredible. And I've never felt like I've been at a brokerage where I can just trust them. It's just about anybody with my business, right? I mean, that's yeah, that's crazy. So, so thank trust, you. yeah. So, one, one thing, tr trust uh, Bryson when he, because he's going to give you the data, he's going to give you the options, and then he's going to let you know what he thinks you should do. The decision's ultimately your point. Your, your decision. Um, and at the end of the day, what's so different is most agents, they just hop in the car, show a home, pray that you want to make an offer on it without a lot of information. And so you feel like you're on your own. And Bryson is the exact opposite of that experience where he's with you every single step of the way. And so again, uh, if you're listening to this, you know, reach out. Like I think Bryson, you put your phone number in here and oh, yeah. have a conversation. It doesn't mean that you have to con commit to him 100% right now, but get into conversation with him and figure out what he knows and how he can help serve you. Even if it doesn't lead to a sale, you still want to connect with Bryson as soon as possible. Yeah, I love just meeting people, honestly. That is one of my favorite things about the YouTube channel is, is I just get to meet people from a bunch of different walks of life. So it was, it was cool to see it grow and, and continue to 
I, I just love providing value to people. <laughs> At the end of the day, it, it, look, my uh, I will be a happy camper as long as I've helped one more person throughout the day. Well, so. also, if you're relocating here, you know, Bryson's married, just got married, has a friend group here, and it's not just about selling you the home. It's about building that relationship, yeah. and Bryson's building a community. You can tap people in to where's the best restaurants, where do you hang out, let's go meet up for coffee, let's go connect you in with other people, let's do sports teams, right? So it's not just selling the home, it's about a lifestyle that you connect with Bryson as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, <laughs> the hyping me up, man. Thank you. It's the um, truth, man. It's easy to do. Yeah. So, uh, well, thank you so much for your time, John. I yep. know it is very valuable. You are doing big things here in Northeast Florida. Um, if you don't know about IMG, which if you've worked with me, you know about IMG, you know yes. about Integrity Mortgage Group um, and all the great things that John is doing uh, within the community to help provide value to agents as well as the community in general, because he is all about win-win uh, opportunities. So thank you so much, John, yes. for everything you do. Thanks, thank John. you for your time and um, let's crush it, man. Sounds good. Thanks, brother.